So I'm going to be presenting a topic um, or a paper that I'm actually co-writing with um, Professor Vita Anani, who's a Canadian colleague of mine at Queen's University um, in Kingston. And the paper's on the status of immoral and offensive uh, trademarks. So every time I said to someone I was talking about trademark law, they said, oh. And then I was like, no, scandalous trademarks. <laughs> so hopefully it will be um, a little bit scandalous. Um, but the focus is on culturally and racially offensive trademarks, in fact. And that's what I'll really be focusing on today. Not just uh, within the trademark system, but also um, within our sort of consumer culture, thinking about the implications of encountering these marks as consumers in our environment. The question itself has been brought into focus quite sharply. Um, by developments in the US um, with recent sort of high stakes litigation in the field. So there was a long running litigation in the United States around um, the registrability or the validity of the Washington Redskins trademark. Um, it was ultimately held at uh, an appeal level to be racially disparaging and therefore to be invalid or non registrable. There was also then a high profile um, US Supreme Court case that I'll be speaking more about, um, which was regarding an Asian American um, band that wanted to call themselves the Slants, but were denied the right to register the Slants as a trademark on the basis that it was racially disparaging. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about these cases as we go. I also wanna put it in context of just a rising tide of concern that we're seeing about the use of sporting mascots that use racial stereotypes, in particular First Nations, Indigenous people stereotypes in um, the US leagues in particular. And there's really a renewed sort of build up of opposition to these kinds of marks and that includes in Canada, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about some developments there. What you may have heard about um, most recently um, is the report that the Cleveland Indians have decided that they're going to abandon using their mascot, Chief Wahoo, um, in their <laughs> trademark, but not until about 2019, and at that point they're just going to not be using it in their current merchandising, but there's no suggestion that they're going to cease using it um, to, in sort of memorabilia, and obviously as you can see, he's still very much alive and well, and there's a great commitment. Uh, to Chief Wahoo amongst the Cleveland fans. So all of this um, sort of motivated us to think about trademarks in this context because we think that the way, especially that the Supreme Court approached the issue in the US, lacked a little bit of nuance and really we need to have a bit more of a fulsome contextual discussion about the validity or the importance of these marks and the extent to which they present human rights and equality concerns as well as concerns about trademark law and trademark doctrine as such. And ultimately what we want to do with the paper is to envisage a way forward for trademark law to actually be leveraged as a small part of a solution to racial inequalities and stereotypes perpetuated by the use of disparaging symbols in sports, in entertainment and elsewhere. Okay, so the other thing just to, for those of you especially who aren't maybe used to thinking too, too much about trademarks as such, it's important to begin, I think, by just emphasizing the extent to which they have this powerful communicative capacity. So in our cultural and commercial sphere, we encounter brands as the main vehicle that companies are using to tell us about their products, to tell us about their services, to tell us about what they want their products to represent or to mean for us as consumers. So the value of a brand is really driven by consumer recognition and by consumer awareness. And that in turn means that there's actually kind of an incentive built in for companies to use a shop value to generate attention, attract attention to their brands and get people thinking about them, noticing them, talking about them, even if it's not in a positive way. So the question really we're asking is whether marks that shock and offend our sense of, on the one hand, just propriety or morality or decency or conscience should be protected by the trademark system 
And then there's also a question of whether they should even be permitted by the trademark system. And on the one hand, this is really just a question about the registrability of particular kinds of marks. So that in itself is the job of trademark law, it's the job of the trademark registrar to look at different signs and signifiers to see how they work in the market. Not every trademark that a company wants to adopt necessarily deserves the law's protection. Right? And we have a whole system that looks at the way um, that the mark is used and what it means to determine whether it should benefit from trademark protection at all. So usually that's in terms of just defining the kind of categories of um, signs and indicia that might qualify as trademarks and also the kind of criteria that they have to meet. So it has to be distinctive, it has to not be confusing, it has to not be generic, it has to not be primarily functional, it has to not be merely a name or a surname or clearly descriptive or misdescriptive. We have lots of rules already about what trademarks can be and what they cannot be in order to merit um, the law's protection. So, this is just a sort of bureaucratic trademark registration question. Is it an appropriate mark? Does it merit that exclusive monopoly that we give to the trademark owner to say that they have exclusive use in a particular commercial sphere, in a particular jurisdiction? Um, on the other hand, this is much more than just a technical or administrative question about what qualifies as a trademark. Um, it's actually about not just our trademark system, but also, as I alluded to, our market economy, our cultural landscape, what we encounter as consumers in the marketplace, and ultimately, we think it's also about a participatory democracy and considerations of equality. So the thing that attracts us to this topic is that we can think about both trademarks and why we protect them and why they matter, but we can also be thinking about the power that the trademark owner has over the meaning of the mark and when they deserve to exercise that power and against whom they can exercise that power, which takes us to larger questions about constitutionality, about freedom of expression, matters of racial, cultural, religious equality, diversity, the right to be free from discrimination, and so on. So all of that, forgive me, is kind of a big introduction, but what I really want to do is give you a sense, a big picture of the issues that we're tackling today before we get down into the case law. This is like the overview for the time I have remaining, and um, what I want to do here, we'll see if I <clears throat> actually manage to get through it, but I want to sort of back up first and give you a little bit of a sense of the background, the international um, landscape for this um, in the uh, legal context. And then we're going to focus in on the US cases for a little bit before moving on to talk about some Canadian developments and the constitutional context in Canada. And all of that's going to take us to these larger normative questions about trademark protection, protection freedom of expression, equality. Um, and then I'm going to suggest some conclusions that I think are not only conclusions for Canadians, but conclusions perhaps for the UK and for Europe as well. And that's why I really want to leave time for questions because I'm interested to hear your response to those suggestions. Okay, so now I'm going to start. <laughs> <coughs> this is Article 6 Congress of the Paris Convention and it allows member states to deny registration to trademarks when they are contrary to morality or public order. So this is then incorporated into um, TRIPS via Article 15 in a sense because that allows for um, member states to deny registration um, provided that the grounds on which they do so do not derogate from the Paris Convention. Okay, so there we have the idea of public uh, morality already at work dating back to the 19th century. Um, and as we move on then we see that there are of course many iterations of limitations based upon public morality in different jurisdictions around the world as permitted by the Convention. So they all actually um, take a variety of different forms and use different terms, but ultimately they have, in the case law, generally targeted the same kinds of marks. So here in the UK, I hope I'm right in saying <laughs> my Scottish trademark law never really evolved, so um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 
Here in the UK, the trademark act bars the registration of marks that are contrary to public policy or to accepted principles of modality. And that's as required by the trademark directive. And then there's also the community trademark regulation, which has about the, the parallel provision in Article 7. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Canadian one later, but for now, let's just take a look at the US Land Map provision, um, which is somewhat more targeted in the way that it articulates the exclusion. So it's talking about marks being refused if they comprise immoral, deceptive, or scandalous matter or matter which may disparage persons or national symbols or bring them into contempt or disrepute. Okay, so disparagement is the one that we'll be focusing on initially, although a model and a scandalous are also present and those of course are the terms that we see and we'll see in the Canadian legislation also. Okay, so we know that those exclusions are permitted by the international IP system Questions are now being asked, however, about the extent to which they're permitted um, under other regimes, and in particular whether they're permitted on a constitutional basis or whether limiting registrability for such marks constitutes um, a limitation upon free speech of the would-be trademark owner, such that they might be permitted by the international IP order but not by the constitution. And this is what was argued and um, ultimately held to be the case in the US Supreme Court case in Tell against Tan. So this was uh, in June 2017, um, the Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional the provision of Section 2A, which allowed the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, to refuse to register disparaging trademarks. Simon Tam is um, of a, um, American Asian descent, and he was fighting for the right, as I mentioned, and to use the mark, the slants. Um, he said he was doing that to reclaim the slur in the name of his band, to reappropriate it, to challenge the kind of stigmatizing associations that were being used or invoked by that term. The trademark office refused the registration because they found that the slants was disparaging um, to people of Asian ancestry. And they noted that the applicant himself was of Asian ancestry. And then to Tan, he argued, well, this is unconstitutional, this is viewpoint discrimination, this is suppression of my speech. So, to the extent that um, Simon, um, well, the, the, the argument is made that the disparagement prohibition is there to protect racialized minorities, to protect them from this kind of stereotyping. Right? And so his response to this argument and to his critics, because many people even within his own community objected to him taking this fight on, and he said, don't be fooled, there's nothing about the way that the trademark office deals with trademarks that suggests that they're in the business of promoting equality and minimizing racial uh, stereotyping. They protect plenty of racially offensive trademarks, they're refusing mine because I'm an Asian American and I want to use this term. Okay? So, um, he rejected the arguments and he fought, as you know, all the way to the Supreme Court for his right to use this. And in the end, of course, the US Supreme Court unanimously agreed that this provision violated the free speech clause. The response to the case was somewhat divided at every level, whether it was from free speech advocates or trademark uh, commentators um, or quality advocates. Many people saw it as something to be celebrated, and many people were very uncomfortable with the result as well for a variety of different reasons. I'm not sure I think it's something to be celebrated because although I, well, we'll see, I'll explain, but I, I kind of agree with the outcome. I don't really like the ratio, I don't really like how they got there. Um, but I also like a good party, so I didn't not celebrate the site. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Tam was attending a conference we were at, and he actually was doing a circuit of all the IP conferences, <laughs> and the band played, and IP professors danced. <laughs> it wasn't cool, but the band was cool. And, um, and he also gave us a speech which explained his experience and why he'd taken up the fight and how he responded to it. And he's a very good speaker, and it was a very powerful presentation, and I can't say that I am, um, whoops, what happened, that I disagreed. There we go, okay. Um, but many people did, and as I say, even in the room, the opinions were divided. So 
As was argued here, this is Cecilia uh, Chang and Daniel Kirstein, and they um, submitted an amici brief in the case as well on behalf of the Asian American uh, Justice Association, I think. Um, what's it called? No, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, excuse me. So they had argued that um, it's all very well and good, and we think, you know, Simon Tam is doing the right thing here, but um, trademarks are not usually about political activism. Trademarks are usually just about profit. So they're used more to silence speech from competitors, to silence critique, than to enrich it. The power to own a trademark is actually the power to control speech, the power to control meaning, and that's what registration affords. So Simon Tam as a trademark owner is the exception that proves the rule. He's the political activist fighting the good fight, but that's not every trademark owner who owns a racially offensive trademark. Okay? And the point comes home when we think about the other case that was at play at the same time. So that was the Washington Redskins case. Now after decades of litigation, and evidence gathering and rulings and reversals, Native American groups had finally succeeded in cancelling that trademark registration on the ground that it was disparaging to Native Americans. Tab's case happened to reach the Supreme Court first, or the Supreme Court happened to grant <laughs> cert to Tab and not to the Washington um, Redskins. Um, but what it means is that, um, that uh, well, like Tam, the NFL team also claimed that it had a First Amendment right to federal trademark protection. So the Mattel case for Tam was actually a decisive victory for the Washington Redskins. Right? Only instead of reclaiming stereotypes, the team was using the benefits of federal registration to perpetuate them and to profit from them. More recently, in um, the Brunetti case, the US Court of Appeals, the judge panel, had to rule on the registrability of the trademark. I don't know if I should say it. <laughs> Fucked. Um, <laughs> okay, for use in association with a paddle. And that had been um, refused registration on the basis it was immoral and scandalous um, under Section 2A. That had been on, appealed, and on appeal, um, the appeal board had affirmed the decision. They had noted that Brunetti uses the mark in the context of strong often explicit sexual imagery that objectifies women and offers degrading examples of extreme misogyny. Um, it was vulgar, it was unregisterable under 2A. But then, the First Amendment protection created by Simon Cam's case meant that Brunetti had the right to register that mark. The US Court of Appeals found that the immoral, scandalous marks provision is also constitutionally invalid. So that seems like, I mean, that's where we are in the US, and the matter is now um, pretty much settled. It's going to be, as um, many people have pointed out, actually interesting to see what else can be done with the notion that a limit on registration um, that's based upon the content of the speech is actually a violation of the First Amendment. One wonders, in fact, how the trademark system can really function uh, effectively that way, but we will see. Um, in the meantime, I'm more interested in picking up the questions that this leaves, because I don't think that this should be the end of the conversation, not in America, but certainly not in other jurisdictions, um, where we're not bound by that ruling. Um, and so that's why I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Canadian law, because I think it offers both some actual practical possibility for a little bit of cross-border political activism, um, but also it offers from a normative perspective um, when all eyes are on the US, an alternative kind of framing of the issues which might give us a little bit more analytic space to address this big normative question, um, which is, should racially offensive marks be protectable under the trademark scheme or even allowable? And um, on what basis might we be able to justify restricting them or restraining their use? If at all. Okay, so as I mentioned, this has become an issue recently in um, Canada as well. And there was a high profile, it's ongoing actually, human rights complaint, not a trademark action, brought by an indigenous activist, a member of the Anishinaabe Nation, Douglas Cardinal, regarding the Cleveland Indians baseball team. And again, the Chief Wahoo logo. So 
Cardinal actually filed applications to a bunch of different courts and tribunals at the last minute trying to secure an injunction to stop the Cleveland Indians from wearing their, um, what do you call them? I'm not a sports person. I was going to say costumes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> strips. Um, <laughs> um, from wearing them and displaying their logo when they were playing in Toronto. Okay, and it was the World Series 2016 game against the Blue Jays three hours before they were due to take the pitch field. <laughs> Still don't know. Um, they, he was trying to make, make it so that the, the game could either not be broadcast or the mascots could not be shown. So ultimately, it was um, the injunction was not issued, and it was one of those interim injunction orders that just on the balance of um, convenience was too late to be properly respected, it was going to cause undue economic harm, and so the game was able to go ahead. And um, Rogers, that's the broadcaster, had said we couldn't really possibly um, not display the logo with this timeline. And they also, of course, talked about their consumers' interest in seeing and enjoying the game, um, or the fans' interest. And then Cardinal, of course, argued that, well, we should be able to see and enjoy the game too, but we can't enjoy the game without suffering racial discrimination when we're exposed to this. And so he stressed in his statements and interviews around the day that this wasn't really just about the use of a logo. And it wasn't about the logo as such, but everything that it represented. And this is against the backdrop of um, a lot of mobilization around the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in Canada trying to improve relations with First Nations peoples and so that was the context in which this fight was being fought. Um, there were a couple of statements made by lawyers that really help us to buckle down on the arguments here. One of them notes that this is really just a claim trying to silence controversial but constitutionally protected speech. And another lawyer says it's trying to prevent the use of a registered Canadian trademark. And if you own a registered Canadian trademark, which the Cleveland Indians do, they have the right to use their trademark in Canada. Okay. Um, so indeed it is, that's what this is about, and indeed they do have a trademark, but it's also, again, a case about a larger issue, which is the use of or how trademark logos constitute um, speech that contributes to racial subordination and cultural oppression, as was argued by uh, my colleagues here in this op-ed. So, actually, um, Cardinal was undeterred by this and continued. We've since had a couple of rulings from human rights tribunals, most recently, um, just in January of this year, where the tribunal ruled that it did have jurisdiction to hear this. It had been argued that because the registered trademark confers a positive right, that basically if you want to attack a right to use the mark, you have to go through the trademark system, you have to argue that it's invalid or we can't use it under the federal trademark regime. And actually what ended up being held in this interim ruling was a trademark confers a negative right which allows you to prevent other people from using your mark. It doesn't give you the unobstructed right to use your mark if in using your mark you violate another law or a human rights norm. And so they said, you don't have to go through the trademark regime, we'll take this on as a human rights issue. So that's ongoing, it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Not least because what it could do, as you know, you'll have gleaned from the discussion, is it could prevent, it could create these cross-border problems for the US teams that persist in using these marks under the First Amendment, now with the stamp of constitutionality in the US, um, because it can interfere with their broadcast. They won't be able to broadcast the US games in Canada. Rogers might still be prevented from broadcasting games and the display the logos that are deemed violations of human rights in Canada. And it's not, it might not seem like a big issue for the NFL, but there are other leagues, again, I'm out of my league, but there are, I think, other sports teams um, <laughs> do play in, in Canada. Uh, American teams who play in Canada, right? So we've got here the Atlanta Braves, the Chicago Blackhawks. They regularly compete in Canada, so the Canadian law can make things very inconvenient for them quite quickly, notwithstanding the ruling in town. Um, what it couldn't do, um, however, the Human Rights Tribunal, would be to deregister the Canadian trademark. Right? You would have to go through the trademark system to do that. 
And so that's where I want to take us um, now. I want to take us to look at the relevant Canadian provisions on immoral marks. So, this is the main provision. This is paragraph 91J. It prohibits the adoption in connection with the business as a trademark or otherwise of a mark that consists of scandalous, obscene, or immoral words or devices. Um, under section 3, it's adopted if it is used or made known or an application is filed in Canada. Under section 12.1e, a mark that falls afoul of that in section 9 cannot be registered, which means it can subsequently be found invalid as not registrable. And section 11, and no person can use a mark that was adopted contrary to that. Okay, so that was quick, don't worry, I'm not going to test you on it. Um, <laughs> But I'll come back and really explain the ways in which it matters. There's two main points to pull out. The first is that the prohibition applies to scandalous, obscene, or immoral works. So it doesn't contain any reference to disparaging marks as such. So what that does is it raises, and this would be the same case in the UK and the EU as well, I think, it raises the interesting question of whether marks that are racially disparaging um, or culturally offensive are therefore scandalous or immoral or obscene, whether they fall within those categories. And we argue in the paper that they are and, and can, we think probably um, we would call them immoral. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. But the examination manual is helpful here as well because it gives us the sense that you judge whether a mark is offensive or obscene or immoral based upon social values at the time. So those social values shift over time. Marks that might not have been uh, immoral or obscene now might be considered such and vice versa. So we think if a mark is it says it regarded as offensive by the general public, then it would qualify. So it includes something, a slur on nationality here. It's interesting to suggest that might be a slur on First Nations peoples. Um, racially disparaging marks might be said to be socially taboo. One would kind of hope they would be socially um, taboo in polite usage or in conflict with moral principles. Um, the other thing oh, I just want to acknowledge in doing this, I think it's kind of important, is that this is a sort of revisionist reading of this provision. So it's important to understand that actually these morality provisions have been used to shore up the dominant religious group, to shore up the dominant population's beliefs, um, so in other words, they've been used to suppress difference rather than to advance equality historically. Okay, so it was really an effort to sustain, let's say, the hegemony of white Christian values, the power of the state in enforcing morality, religious strictures, sexual constraints, heteronormativity. These are the old cases that came under this provision. So when I'm suggesting to you we could actually use it to advance equality, that's a repurposing. Um, of what has been, frankly, an anachronistic and suppressive um, provision that has been used to subordinate minorities for decades. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the Canadian prohibition is that it's not just about valid registration. It's actually about use. It's not even just about commercial use, use as a trademark or otherwise. It's an enormously broad prohibition um, when you read the section 91J in particular, it emphasizes that we're not just, again, talking about whether a mark can be registered and can benefit from trademark protection, but whether an injunction could actually be obtained to prevent it from being used. And any interested person can obtain an injunction to prevent it from being used. They just have to show that they have an interest in doing so. So this is important because it was a big part of the argument around the Slants case, um, although it ultimately wasn't needed, was the argument that this isn't really about the First Amendment, because you can still use Redskins, you just can't get the federal protection, the benefits of registration, but no one's telling you you can't use it. Now in Canada, we would be telling you you can't use it. Right? And I actually think and this is probably one of the more controversial arguments that we're going to assert, um, that this is the right thing to do. And that is because 
and uh, not with regard to the slants, as I'll say in a moment, but generally with regard to racially disparaging marks, it's the right thing to do because generally in trademark law, if you can use a mark, you can acquire rights in it. And if you can acquire rights in it, you can register it. So it's actually very hard to parse the idea of using it and acquiring common law rights and then the capacity to obtain the registration. If you're not entitled to register it, you shouldn't be able to acquire rights in it, which reasoning backwards means you shouldn't really be allowed to use it in a commercial context where you generate reputation and goodwill. It's an aside, that's why I did it quickly, but mm -hmm. <laughs> if you follow me good then I'm happy to pick up on it after. So also it's just more consistent with the political rationale. If we don't want these marks to be used, we don't want to afford them the benefits of registration, then, um, then we don't want to see them in the marketplace and we don't want to allow common law rights to be held over them, so we prohibit their use. People who were worried um, about the prohibition and worried about commercial speech will be very concerned about the broad sweep of the Canadian prohibition. People who want to use it as political activists to suppress racially disparaging marks should be very happy about the broad sweep of that prohibition. It at least causes us to face the big constitutional question head on. Okay? We have to ask whether limitations on speech, on commercial speech of this kind, are constitutionally justifiable. Okay? So this is going to be your super quick Canada Constitution 101 mm -hmm. um, lesson. But as you'll see, there are lots of parallels um, to the constitutional documents with which you'll be more familiar. Um, basically, we have here um, the right of freedom of expression, but we have, and this is what distinguishes us somewhat from the US scheme, um, a very clear limit to the rights that are protected by the um, Constitution, and that is any reasonable limit prescribed by law that's demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. There is a test called the Oaks Test, which takes you through whether the limit is justifiable. It's not dissimilar, again, to other tests, whether in the US or in Europe, um, but something that is an important objective, something that's, and then the law must actually help to advance that important objective in some way, with rational connection, minimal impairment of the right, and not a disproportionately severe effect. Okay, so um, the potential breadth of the prohibition on um, immoral marks is going to mean that I think the trickiest thing here for us to get around is going to be the question of minimal impairment. I don't know if you even have the disease scan here. <laughs> minimal impairment is always the trickiest one, right? And uh, I know I'm not good at it. So I think that's going to be the problem for um, the Section 91J prohibition. It's just maybe perhaps arguably overbroad. But um, with that said, and acknowledging the risk that this could be used to silence the kind of marks that we want to see used, um, we're going to write in favour of employing the prohibition strategically to target racial slurs and culturally offensive marks. Um, we think if we carry on applying the prohibition the way it has been so far, it's probably not constitutionally justifiable, it's probably invalid. But we think if you sort of invert that purpose and say we're trying to use this to correct historical injustices, to empower minority voices, to further equality, to protect people from discrimination, that becomes a justifiable limit on the freedom of commercial speech under the Charter. Um, so, you know, Simon Tam argued that the Trademarks Office should be protecting minorities, but wasn't using the provision to do that. We think that the provision, the prohibition, can be used to protect minorities and should be. We think the government should care about addressing racism through the trademark law system, it has the power to do it, we think it has the obligation to do it. So we're actually supporting Douglas Cardinal when he wants to shut down um, the Cleveland Indians, and we're on Simon Tam's side when he wants to use the slants. So we're trying to work out how we can make both of those arguments, and we think that we can when we approach it through the lens of equality on this sort of constitutional plane. What we're really saying is it requires a contextual analysis that looks at who's seeking to use the mark, how it's going to be used, 
and thinking about whether it advances equality or whether it obstructs it. We think reappropriating stereotypes and selling them back to the dominant group is a way to effectively disrupt the status quo and to challenge prejudices. And that it's part of a struggle for equality and the government should permit it and they should protect it. So in other words, the argument is it doesn't have to be the case that the slants and the redskins stand and fall together. Tam's use of slants is an identity affirming reappropriation, not an immoral mark. It should be permitted, it should be registrable. Cleveland's use of Indians and its mascot is a racially disparaging use by a trademark owner who has no natural claim to use indigenous symbolism, so it is an immoral mark. Um, is discriminatory and that deprives it of its moral claim. It should be unregisterable, it should be prohibited. Morality is context um, driven. This is what they changed their band name to during the litigation. Okay, so this is all part of recognizing the power of trademarks as symbolic speech, the communicative pu uh, function that they, they serve in our marketplace and in our culture. And so when we reimagine them as potentially empowering marginalized actors and voices, we can see the way in which the trademark law system might be used to protect marginalized groups rather than to perpetuate social subordination. We think this is actually perfectly consistent with the trademark system and the way it works. The trademark system itself is built on the acknowledgement of the communicative function and the power of these commercial symbols, the meanings that they can generate, the allegiances that they can form, and that's what it recognizes and protects. So as soon as we're judging the validity of a trademark and thinking about its lawfulness, we're already thinking about trademark law and the way it works anyway. So we can take it further, but this is just maybe more of an example. Um, the trademark system can be used to prohibit marks like Redskins, Indians, and Blackhawks as racially disparaging and allow things like the slants or dykes on bikes. That was another US example where they were denied that mark um, as um, an attempt to reclaim and give new meaning in a powerful political way that should be supported and in fact must be allowed under the Constitution. So the ones on the left perpetuate inequalities and the ones on the right resist them. The ones on the left subordinate, the ones on the right empower. So the only question I think that remains to be um, answered, and this is perhaps already what you were worrying about, is whether the trademark office or the administrative board that makes decisions about registrability can legitimately draw the kinds of distinctions that I'm suggesting should be drawn here. And of course my answer is sure, <laughs> or at least they should. Um, so there's a couple of things just from a constitutional perspective and I'm well, quite well versed to address what the equivalent might be, but we're saying that this could be justified as, okay, so everyone has a right to be treated equally before the law. Maybe what we're suggesting is that the court is to look, or the um, registrar is to look at the racial identity of the person applying for the trademark and then decide whether it's registrable based on that. So that's getting uncomfortable, um, and we're not taking it, I don't think, that far. I'll explain in a moment. But the important thing is that we are allowed laws that do draw distinctions. Um, if they are, their object is the amelioration of conditions of individuals or groups who disadvantage because of race, national or ethnic origin or colour. So again, constitutionally we could justify treating these marks differently um, than the way that we treat others. Um, there's also an interesting exception, I'm not sure if this has any analogy here, which says that if one of these prohibited marks actually has the consent of the user, or the consent of the person who's supposed to be protected by the prohibition, then it can be used anyway. So that's actually designed to, like it allows people to allow their name to be used for endorsement functions, you know, the licensing of these prohibited marks. And what it would allow here, I think, is maybe to say 
that when the applicant or the user belongs to the group that we think is being protected by the prohibition, that would be a relevant consideration that might say that it has consent. Maybe at least we could say when there's evidence that a substantial portion of the relevant group actually approve of the use, as Simon Tan argued was the case with regard to the slants amongst the Asian Americans that he surveyed. Um, it's still a concern, of course, um, that decisions are going to be made based upon the identity of the applicant. Um, on the other hand, once again, what we argue is that decisions are always made about registrability based upon who it is that's applying for the mark, if that person is really the source of the product, if they're really going to be recognised as being the true source of that product in the market. Um, it's already the job of the trademark examiner to ask these questions about who the trademark represents in the minds of consumers and what the message and meaning of that mark is in the marketplace. So this is just another aspect of that decision-making power that is already being exercised all the time. Okay, so this is the point I was really just making and I'm just going to come back and emphasize it quickly. Basically, um, if we have a provision that prohibits or prevents the model marks, I think we should be using it to enhance autonomy and the values of equality and non-discrimination. And that means, in the Canadian context, that we think it should be used to prevent the use of Indigenous names in association with sports teams, and we think it should be used to allow and uh, protect marks that are used for the purposes of empowerment and resistance. Um, I want to, this is where I want to get to, so I'm going to just do it. Um, my understanding is, and this is where I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe only after, once the video shut up. Um, <laughs> it's still fair to say, I think, in the European context, um, as Justice Pumphrey did in um, 2007, that the relationship between Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights and trademark law has yet to be really carefully worked out, and that the same is true, I think, for the prohibition of immoral marks um, specifically. I know there have been a few cases, they tend to find that either freedom of expression isn't directly implicated, or they seem to suggest that if it were, that it would be excused, but they haven't really engaged in that kind of analysis. Is that fair? Okay, good. Getting a nod. Good. Um, so there's a case about, um, this is a, was a case about uh, the use of Mr. and Miss World for a transsexual beauty pageant and Miss World, um, or the trademark owner of Miss World, objected to that. In this case, um, Justice Pumphrey acknowledged that there was, um, or refused to find that the, any pre um, the preventing them from using Mr. and Miss World was um, a violation of any Article 10 right, but did acknowledge that there was a potential conflict if the use of a sign was telling a political story or making a political point or identifying some matter of public importance. There was also um, this case about the mark Screw You and um, here we have a nice articulation of what, why the prohibition is acceptable, right? That we don't want to be privileging um, through trademark registration and um, people who are using marks um, that offend against basic values of civilized society. So I would expect that racialized or racially disparaging trademarks could fit into that category and therefore we might object to using the trademark system to protect them. And like the Canadian Constitution, Article 10 is not absolute, um, so to the extent that it prohibits uh, that prohibiting immoral marks might be said to impinge upon Article 10.1, it could then, I think, probably be saved by Article 10.2 based upon the kind of arguments that I've been um, putting to you. So this would be a restriction of freedom of expression necessary in a democratic society for the protection of, I would say, maybe morals, and more importantly, I think, for the protection of the rights of others. Um, which is not something that I've seen argued in the European literature thus far, but I think, to me, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so I'll just finish with this. If the fundamental constitutional values 
of equality and dignity and participatory democracy are at stake, as I think they are, um, then when we use racially disparaging marks, when we encounter them in our culture, then in contrast to the US position now, post town we should be harnessing the power of trademark law, its regulatory effectiveness to restrict the power and the profitability of these marks in our commercial sphere. And we shouldn't be doing it in a paternalistic way to protect against or to protect old fashioned morality. We should be doing it in a way that advances a democratic participatory.